but a more knowledgeable, informed, hardworking person to work with. And so it has just been an absolute pleasure, Tanya, for me to have the opportunity to work with you during those years. And uh, when you were off on maternity leave, although you really were not off, I mean, you were away <laughs> on maternity leave. It would have been great had we had this legislation in place at that particular time. You did an outstanding job with or without it. You maintained uh, your work ethic, even though you had other things in which to be concerned about. And so I think this bill is a testament to the strength of two women because you actually processed it through committee, got all of the work done that we needed to get done. So it's, it's a testament to the work of both Representative Carolyn Maloney, who introduced, championed, and stayed with it, and it's a testimony to our staff director, Tanya Shan. And Mr. Chairman, I'm very pleased to be a co-sponsor of this legislation and would very proudly vote for it and urge all of my colleagues to do so. And I yield back. Will the gentleman yield? Yes. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, okay. Uh, let, let me just say uh, to you, Mr. Davis, uh, thank you for your great leadership as, uh, as chairman of this subcommittee. Uh, I had the great honor and pleasure to serve uh, at your elbow, I guess, uh, as a ranking member in the last, last Congress. And I learned a lot uh, by serving with you. Uh, I think the, that uh, those constituents in the federal employment and, and working for the post office and, and residents of the District of Columbia were greatly served by, by, by you as, as chairman. And uh, if I can fill one of your shoes, then, then that'll be that'll be a lot, and uh, I just want to thank you for your your very measured and uh, uh, thoughtful leadership of this and, and dynamic leadership of this subcommittee during your tenure. Thank, thank you. you very much, Mr. Chairman. If I might observe. <laughs> That's right. I like to uh, Chairman now recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter, for five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, it's a kind of an uh, unusual moment for me because uh, my daughter uh, last night delivered baby, uh, baby girl, my second uh, grandchild, and she had a uh, difficult uh, uh, pregnancy. My uh, granddaughter came uh, 30 days early. Uh, she uh, was a school teacher and she had to struggle with could she be on her feet? Does she need to take certain days off? Is it with pay, without pay? Uh, and all those type of, of challenges. Uh, her husband is an accountant in the middle of tax season right now. His firm is, is struggling uh, uh, to how, how to cover all the business they have. It's not uh, struggling financially, but it's not a good time for him to take a, a couple of weeks off to uh, be with her and uh, bond. Uh, and uh, I say this because I think it's important to be generous, but it also needs to be flexible. And I have uh, grave reservations about this bill. I could never support this bill. And there's two basic reasons. One is, particularly at this point in time, uh, when people in my district can't find a job, they're losing half of their uh, savings in many cases. To be generous with their money to government employees is a tad of an insult, quite frankly, that, um, that this isn't free money that we're kind of taking out of our pockets here. We're being generous with taxpayers who are being hammered right now to tell them that their government employees, in many cases, are going to get benefits that they don't get. Now, I don't believe we should mandate it in the private sector, and I believe there are a lot of reasons not, but I believe it, it that uh, while maybe you can get away with that argument in normal times that you should lead, I don't agree with that principle right now. We shouldn't be more generous than people who are struggling to make their house payments, to pay their health care, and, and struggling, and be more uh, generous to federal employees than most Americans are. I realize big corporations have generous leave policies, but most Americans don't have that. 
The second part of this is the, the financial and the actual structure of this, because when you do this, really it's a, a, to some degree an employment policy for government employees, because when people take leave, you have to get replacement government employees, so it's a hiring policy for the federal government at no cheap uh, cost. But in addition to that, there is the challenge of how you deal uh, with, for example, it doesn't appear Schedule C employees are covered. Why aren't political employees covered? Are they too important? Are, they, uh, are we saying that regular government employees uh, are uh, less critical positions, therefore they can afford to take leave, but boy, we wouldn't let a Schedule C, a political appointee, uh, take leave. And if you did let a political employee take leave, or even the career people right now in TARP, I don't particularly want a husband to take time when I'm trying to figure out how to get the leasing done for retail floor plans for RVs and autos so people can get employed to suddenly decide he's taking a couple weeks off to bond with his uh, uh, new uh, daughter. I think sometime at the hospital, but there needs to be some flexibility in this. I don't want DEA agents and people who are in drug enforcement to suddenly disappear in the middle of a big case. I don't particularly want to try to figure out when I'm flying uh, home every weekend whether an air traffic controller has an adequate re sudden replacement on, uh, on a medical leave. There are lots of challenges with this bill inside even the career employees not even dealing with the, the uh, management uh, sections. I believe that this would be a bad bill in multiple ways in addition to a stocking horse to mandate this in the private sector. So I'm strongly against this bill. I, I, I don't think there's any point really today to doing amendments here, but I hope we have a more uh, complete and, and uh, full debate in the full committee with uh, lots of different amendments. One other thing, in my earlier life when I was a staff member and the, the non-paid parental leave bill went through, my boss supported it and I worked in trying to come up with lots of different amendments. Unfortunately, a lot of the regulations came from from different concerns I raised, both the executive branch and in the legislative process, on key employees 50 miles uh, apart. So now we have plants 50 miles apart. That number of employees that can be covered when you exempt small business, you, you do that. Well, the government's going to have the same challenges that the private sector had, even in mandated unpaid leave, yet alone this. I thank the gentleman and yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair recogni now recognizes uh, the gentlelady from the District of Columbia. Ms. Norton, for five minutes. Well, Mr. Chairman, I take note of the fact that, that in your first markup, you've shown where your values are. And to very much appreciate that this bill is your first bill. I also appreciate the hearing that's going to be held today on a very important sector of not only the economy, but an important uh, <coughs> agency that um, is suffering in these times. Uh, my good friend uh, from New York deserves all the credit in the world for not giving up. Um, this bill wasn't passed during good times, and if it's not being passed now, as most, uh, amen, uh, as most legislation of, of this kind is passed, most legislation of this kind is passed precisely at times like this. Look at when all of the New Deal legislation, for example, uh, was past. Uh, as for Ta Tanya Shan, I would, I would uh, congratulate her as well on her new position in OPM, except to say she sure missed the mark because if somehow she would gotten this through last year, she could have, uh, have participated in this very, uh, <laughs> in this very benefit. Uh, but she kept working. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, when you consider how much rhetoric and ink has been spent on families and how little this Congress has done for families. It should bring shame on us that we have finally moved to the point where the federal government, which is supposed to lead the federal sector, is now following much of the federal sector in giving paid leave of four lousy weeks to new mothers uh, 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 after a birth. Um, it, the, the federal government prides itself on its leadership. It's way behind in many of its benefits, which is why as the baby boomers retire, they are not being replaced. Uh, but I, I, I see such a disconnect 
between those who talk the talk of fam families, but the moment something comes forward to do something about families, it costs too much money. Let me say why this is so important. The very people who don't want to support this now because the economy's down did not support unpaid family uh, medical leave when the economy was up. So, so I, they've shown what their bottom line is. It's time for the federal government to finally do what it should have done decades ago, and I mean decades ago, because if, you had, if we had done it decades ago, we would at least be even with every single economy, Western economy, and uh, 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 e economy with which we compete in the world. Uh, it is, it is, it is a, a matter of great shame that uh, it took us years to get the unpaid family medical and leave. Uh, and let me tell you who that benefits. We're very pleased to have that on the books. But if you look at who it benefits, uh, you will see that it benefits people who already may have had some leave because they work for people like the federal government who may have had to borrow from their leave. And it benefits people, uh, women uh, particularly, uh, who are uh, the best educated and are at the top tier of the workforce. If you ask the average woman out here, don't even begin to talk about single mothers, whether or not you have had any benefit from the unpaid 12 weeks or even a few weeks, they will tell you about yourself. Because these are the parents that are running back to work, first of all, because they can't afford the time off with no money. And, and, and second, because there's no uh, child care in this country, uh, educational child care of the kind they have in every single country that has paid family medical leave. If the federal government doesn't step up first, uh, how can we expect others to take care of their families? Uh, so the notion that we can't pay for it now, we couldn't pay for it when the general lady introduced it, when the derivatives and the rest of it were sending the economy uh, off the top, is what you're going to hear until we get to work and pass this bill. It's urgent to pass now. It's, it's important for the federal government uh, to be the example that's, that, that steps forward now, and it will have a, an important beneficial effect on the average working woman who has not benefited from unpaid family medical leave. There being no further opening statements, I ask unanimous consent that members' written statements be included in the record without objection so ordered. Uh, I now open H.R. 626 for consideration. Without objection, the reading of the bill will be dispensed with. Uh, and without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. I now move that the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce Postal Service in the District of Columbia report H.R. 626 is introduced to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform with the recommendations that the bill does pass. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 626 to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and H.R. 626 is ordered reported to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. There being no further business before the Committee, we will stand in recess.